Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Hey, welcome here. Welcome here. Please have a seat. <clears throat> so, um, welcome here. This is a this is a session about um, that all the PTLs in OpenStack have. It's an opportunity for uh, all the projects in OpenStack to give an update on uh, what they are working on. Uh, it, this is a session about Triple O. So this is this is going to be about um, what's going on in Triple O and what we are doing now and what we will do next. So if you are interested by Triple O, if you just curious, uh, that's I think a, a good place to be now. Um, my name is Emilia Maki. I'm French, as you can listen. I live in Canada and I work for Red Hat. I'm the current uh, project technical lead. And uh, I am uh, with my friends because I don't like talking alone. So, <laughs> uh, Flavio, if you want to introduce. Yeah, so um, uh, my name is Flavio. I also work at Red Hat. Um, I'm, I do many things in OpenStack. I'm being in the TC is one of them. And yeah, I'm right now I'm working on deployment and specifically putting OpenStack on containers as part of the Triple O project. Yeah, I'm Steve Hardy. I um, also work for Red Hat. I've been working on Triple O, and previous to that, mostly uh, Heat for a number of years. And uh, today, I'm going to talk a bit about the composability and uh, uh, also c containers, um, as Flavio mentioned. Great. So the agenda. Um, I will start with uh, what's going on in Pike, what we are doing. Uh, the cycle is not finished yet. We are in the middle, I think. So um, I'm just going to give an overview of what we are doing, what we already did uh, partially, and what we are going to finish in Pike, what we aim to finish. Um, and then we will, um, I will give an update on what's going on in the deployment tools in OpenStack and try to uh, mention some things that the Triple O project is working on with the other project in OpenStack. So you can also understand, uh, you know, how do we collaborate in OpenStack community. Um, to make the deployments tool better, I guess. The next thing will be uh, all the things about containers, what we are doing around containers, and uh, uh, which is a kind of interesting topic at this time. The next one will be about upgrades and uh, all this composability. Uh, Steve will uh, explain you how Triple O is something that uh, you can compose your own architecture and deployments. So. Uh, you can also upgrade, all, all, all this thing works. Um, and we will, we will finish, and during the discussion today, we are going to talk about the roadmap all the long, but at the end, we have like a, just a slide summarizing the next step for us, like the roadmap, but keep in mind, this talk is like always talking about the next thing, so. Um, but yeah, the, the last slide will be more about like a summary of what we are doing. Uh, I think we will have time for Q&A if you have any question and feedback during the presentation or at the end, please, there is a microphone and you're, you're very welcome to ask anything. So let's start. Um, what's going on in Pike? So I try to, um, when I did the slides, uh, I did my part of this section and I was like, Okay, should we list all the blueprints? So, so I try to classify the blueprints. The first one is about uh, security. Uh, what we are doing in Triple O to improve the security. Um, the, first, the first big thing that is coming is the TLS Everywhere blueprints. Uh, it was, I think, started in Okata cycle and it didn't finish uh, all the work. So it's postponed to, to this cycle in Pike. Uh, we have made good progress on this area, and that basically allows you to deploy uh, OpenStack and also infrastructure services um, with uh, TLS enabled. So that's something uh, interesting. We also started to deploy uh, a TCD for uh, the net from some networking tools in OpenStack, and we we deployed a TCD um, at the end of Okata cycle, and in this cycle in Pike. We are working the um, how to secure ATCD, and which is by the way using uh, the TLS Everywhere blueprint. So the, this is like connected to the TLS Everywhere. Um, ATCD will be used more. Uh, I, I will come back on this topic, but 
a TCD is going to be used uh, in, in Triple O and in OpenStack over the next cycle. So this is something we try to focus before uh, moving the service in production and widely used, we want to make sure it's secure. So that's something we, we are working on right now. Um, we, have, we also have some people working on the, uh, the, the advanced intrusion detection environment. So we are uh, introducing these uh, uh, new services in Triple O so the users can run um, um, and can run some audits, audits tool. Uh, and we also have, um, this is an ongoing work over the cycles, but uh, in Pike we are, I think uh, we aim to um, deploy all the OpenStack services using uh, the Hot Token plugin, which is uh, using the Keystone V3 API, uh, which is a, a um, interesting thing for uh, using all the V3 features in Keystone. Um, moving to the next one about networking. Um, we have uh, integrated Open Delight in, I think, in the previous cycle. I, I can't remind you, but uh, the, the, this cycle in Pike, we have people working on HA for Open Delight services. Um, we also have integrated the BGP VPN from Neutron in, in Triple We have some uh, progress on Octavia integration. We have people working on OVS 2.6 and the DPDK features. Uh, we, uh, I think we added the SRIOV in the previous cycle and people now are working towards with the features from OVS, uh, the new version of OVS and how Triple O can use the DPDK features. Um, and we also have uh, L2 Gateway integration uh, in this cycle. So that's the major things um, about networking. I think Steve has an update about um, the composable networking in this cycle, but uh, he will talk about it later. Um, oops, there is some. Okay. We have some uh, user interface changes. Um, the, the, one, the first one was about um, we, we got the feedback from uh, triple O users, triple O operators, and one of the feedback was that uh, it was hard for users to discover all the services you can deploy with triple O. And so we listened to you and we, uh, we worked on having a, a tool in triple O that discovers all the services uh, and exposed to the end user so they can uh, understand more how they, what they can deploy with Triple O and how they can deploy like all the services and all the roles that you can compose. The, that's something we are going to expose more uh, in a friendly way for the users in this cycle. The second thing is about the UI. You will be able to import and export uh, the, the deployment plans uh, uh, directly from the user, user interface. And we have something about split stack, and uh, I think James is going to talk about it if you have the microphone. Test. Yes. Okay, so in a normal triple O deployment, you usually have to use Ironic to deploy the, uh, the bare metal nodes themselves. Uh, what this allows you to do is you can use the pre provision nodes, uh, you, and you can use uh, a different tool such as Cobbler or Foreman to deploy the initial nodes and then we can actually orchestrate the OpenStack services on top of that. Uh, we've been able to do this since Okada um, and in Pike we're looking at making that a little bit easier to use so that you can pre-configure the agents on each of the nodes uh, so you don't have to wait for heat to start to create the initial stack. Uh, so hopefully it'll be easier to use in Pike. Thanks. Okay, let's try to go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so um, Triple O is involved in, um, in some kind of deployment working group. Uh, we are trying to not solve, not only in Triple O, but we are trying to solve some problems outside Triple O so the community can use it. And in the last PTG in Atlanta, we went in a room between Triple O and other deployment tools 
uh, together trying to uh, you know uh, list all the challenges that we have and trying to work together on on those challenges instead of trying to fix it just in Tripolo and you know uh, one of the things was um, the configuration management uh, all the projects in OpenStack they have their own way to you know um, get the parameters and apply the parameters into the config files and that thing might sound easy but it's not easy you have to maintain so many things all the interface and all the parameters you have to maintain uh, for example in Tripolo we have the puppet modules and every cycle we have more and more parameters that we need to maintain so we were looking for a way how can we uh, use a, uh, the a unified um, um, a unified way to manage all those parameters and that's something we are working on we had a session on Monday afternoon this week um, there is a, a an interpad about the output I will send an email to the mailing list af uh, after the, the summit probably next week about what's going on and what are the next steps but uh, basically, Tripolo is uh, highly involved in this work. We are going to investigate how we can use OTCD to start the configurations and how we can make OpenStack services um, getting the config from OTCD instead of uh, files. So that's, that's the big thing for configuration management. And that's, uh, it's, it's a cross-project work with uh, other projects in OpenStack. There is one thing I just mentioned in the slide. We are not actively working on it, but uh, this is just a thought that uh, we have some people investigating how can we uh, make the Keystone Fernet keys rotations um, um, in, in Keystone itself or somewhere in OpenStack. Um, I, I, was, I was looking at doing it in Tripolo and I realized that everyone in OpenStack needs this feature. So uh, if there is someone in the room looking at this and interested by this work, uh, we didn't have uh, the resources yet to start this work, but uh, that's something we are interested by, uh, the, the Keystone Fernet keys rotations. Um, I think that's it for the deployment working group. Uh, we have now um, Flavio talking about containers, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, just kind of go over here. I'll try not to talk too much so there's time for questions. Um, so the containerization effort uh, in Triple O, it is a multi-year um, or multi-cycle, actually, in a year um, effort where we're trying to move the OpenStack services from bare metal into containers. And this is something that started as, as part of the Pike um, development cycle. And uh, the, first, um, the first two cycles, so Pike and Queens, and are going to rely on the Docker runtime. So we're going to uh, containerize the services, and they're going to run on, on Docker daemon, basically. And eventually, the goal is to move all these services and have them running on, on Kubernetes. Um, we're, we're collaborating, or we're trying to collaborate more and more with other um, uh, projects upstream, as, as also as, as Emily Ann mentioned. Uh, there's a deployment um, working group. And, and as part of that, we like to reuse as much as possible. So we're using Cola Build to um, create images. That means that um, the Cola images that the Cola project uses are the same ones that we're using for, um, for, this, for deploying uh, the services inside containers. So, um, and well, we've, we've been working with these guys. We're not using anything else from Cola, and I want to make that um, very clear. So it's, it's less confusing um, since they kind of like, uh, they kind of like try to cover uh, the same thing. So Cola and Cola and Kubernetes and, and Triple O, they're doing pretty much the same thing. So we're using the, uh, the images that are generated using, using Cola Build, which is why I just wanted to be very explicit there. And the other thing is we want to introduce the least minimum um, number of, of changes possible to the architecture in the first two releases so that we can focus on containerizing the services and we don't have to worry about um, changing the architecture as, as, as you guys know it today. Um, I'll, I'll go into more details about that in the next slide. And um, one of, since we don't want to change architecture, we want to make this um, switch as simple as possible. We're also working with, well, Steve is actually working more, uh, more than I do on that. Um, and the upgrades from bare metal into a uh, containerized deployment. So this is not going to be like a greenfield stuff. Like you don't have to come up with a brand new environment to, uh, to have your containerized services. So if you have a bare metal deployment of OpenStack, um, we'll like to provide a, a way to migrate from that bare metal deployment into a containerized one um, using, um, using Triple O directly. 
and more on what I mean of, with not changing the architecture. Um, we, we're going to, in the, the first two releases, we're going to use the host network. Um, so we're not, we're not relying on any of the virtual networks provided by the Docker daemon. And for different reasons, and we can go into more details on that later if, if, you, if you're interested. But we're going to use the host network, and that allows us for um, maintaining the current um, networking architecture and providing network isolation and IPv6 support and all the kind of things that um, you guys are probably already consuming if you're using Triple O. And we're logging uh, most of, well, uh, yeah, we're logging to var log basically. And again, different reasons to do that. It, regardless on whether we'll also log to a um, standard output within the container, we're going to keep logging to var log. And again, we don't want to introduce um, many changes into the architecture. So there are tools that rely on var logs to actually have the logs for the services. And if we stop logging to var log right now, we're going to break all those tools. So since we can log to var log because we're running on Docker daemon and we know where the services are running and the controller nodes and computer nodes are going to stay the, are going to stay the same, uh, we decided to just go down that road and, and avoid breaking all the tools and having everyone updating their tools. So eventually that might change after Queens, but at least for the next two releases, we don't really need to worry about that. And there's more time for tools to update and change and evolve with uh, O as, as, we, as we make these changes. We still use Puppet to generate config files. We don't use Puppet to run the services anymore or, or install them. We do use it to generate the config files. So, um, so yeah, we still depend on Puppet, basically. I also, I, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, we are reducing the use of, uh, the use of Puppet uh, within Triple O, but for the config files, we, we really depend on that, and it runs from within the container um, image itself. And one thing I, I wanted to mention to is, is that it, this was all implemented using composable roles. So if you're familiar with the composable roles and you, you were uh, relying on those in some way in the APIs, et cetera, uh, you, can still, uh, you can still do that. We, we implemented all these as part of the, uh, well, reusing the composable roles uh, that were introduced in a couple of releases ago. So yeah, that's, that's it from the container side. So if you have any questions like at the end of the talk, feel free to ask them or if you can catch me afterwards and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Javier. Um, so, yeah, I was going to go into a bit more detail in terms of the composability and also the way which we're handling upgrades. Um, some of this is uh, improvements which have happened over the last uh, two to three cycles, um, but it kind of all fits together in terms of uh, the implementation for containerization and the roadmap uh, for Pike and beyond. So. Back in Newton, uh, we introduced this concept of fully composable roles. Prior to that, um, Triple O had a, a fairly sort of static architecture where we expected um, you know, specific um, groups of nodes to be deployed. So you had a controller and a compute and then certain types of storage. Um, from Newton and beyond, um, that's now fully customizable. Um, and so there were kind of two parts to that. One was we had to decompose the configuration of all the services. Um, and I'll show a diagram in a, in a second which shows how that fits together. But basically, we now have one heat template. So Triple O is heavily dependent on heat as an orchestration tool. Um, and uh, we have one heat template per service now. So we've basically decomposed um, all of the definition of the configuration of each service. Um, so you can more flexibly consume that data. Um, and then we have one Puppet profile, um, which is in the Puppet Triple O repository. Um, and that's basically, again, just um, a nice way to encapsulate each service configuration. Uh, so you can have more flexibility at, at deployment time. And then the final piece of this was um, enabling custom roles. So this basically um, allows you to have a YAML file with a list of roles. So you can have um, custom uh, node types, which could be like an SDN controller or uh, for a special type of storage. Or you might want to break out your neutron, neutron services to run on a separate node, or perhaps have Keystone running on a, on a separate um, node uh, or group of nodes. Uh, and that's all now possible, uh, whereas prior to Newton it wasn't. Um, and so that presents an interesting problem when it comes to upgrades um, in that you don't any longer know where the services are running, as in which services are running on, on which nodes. Um, and so you can't have a monolithic approach to upgrades. And so during a Carter, um, we introduced a new model for upgrades, which we called composable upgrades. So it's basically uh, um, going with the general theme of decomposing uh, the logic that we had um, uh, prior to the Carter release. And we did that basically by using um, uh, some Ansible tasks in the service templates. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, 
So this is all working out quite nicely for us. Um, it has provided an easier interface for integrators to Triple O as well, um, in that now if you're integrating a new service or you need to modify configuration for an existing service, you really just have to look at one heat template. Um, whereas before, there were some quite big puppet manifests and a fair degree of complexity um, that some people found um, a, a bit of a barrier to entry. So I think that's made, um, for, from an integration point of view, um, the, the story quite a lot nicer. And um, in terms of uh, networking, that's kind of the next step in terms of uh, composability for us. Um, a lot of people are, are wanting to define um, you know, uh, uh, custom network names and custom, custom arbitrary um, uh, network topologies. Currently, we support a model for network isolation where there's a fixed number of networks which you can either enable or disable. Um, and in the future, uh, we are seeking to enable operators to define that however they like, um, and particularly for certain um, uh, SDN and uh, NFB use cases, I think that's particularly interesting. Um, so that's something which we're working towards for Pike, and uh, I'm hoping that we're going to make progress towards uh, enabling fully customizable uh, uh, networking layer uh, during Pike. So this is just a quick diagram to kind of like hopefully reinforce um, what I described in terms of composable services. This is basically what allows like um, the service plugin model uh, for Triple O. Um, we have a heat template uh, per service, and then the data within that gets merged together um, at deployment for each group of nodes. So let's say you have um, your controllers. Um, we merge together all of the data for the services you've assigned to the controller. Uh, role, um, and then that gives us the data we need to configure the services um, at deployment time. So um, if anyone's interested in more details, there are some, um, some, some uh, notes uh, on my blog, and also in the Triple O docs, there's a walkthrough of how this all fits together. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the next, uh, the next part to this is enabling uh, arbitrary uh, groups of nodes, um, you know, operator-defined um, uh, roles. We, we, role is our term for uh, the groups of nodes. And so the way we did this is to use Jinja2 templating um, as like a, a pre-processing step. Um, and that basically enables us to, to generate some things in the heat templates, um, which previously was uh, more of a hard-coded system. Um, it's quite flexible. And the other thing to mention is within the plan, the plan is the term for the, the, the heat templates that we upload uh, into uh, into Triple O to do the deployment. Uh, if you need to do Jinja 2 templating based on the roles in your uh, custom templates, that's also possible. Um, so this is quite a flexible system um, now. And so one thing which is worth mentioning is uh, if you're interested in playing with this feature, there's a, a roles data file in the heat templates now. You can just copy that and then pass minus R roles data. Uh, so it's quite a, a, an easy interface to experiment with. Um, so that brings us on to upgrades. And as I mentioned, we, we kind of really had to make this um, uh, more of a composable solution um, due to the flexibility afforded by uh, custom roles and uh, composable services. And the way we did this is basically now in each of the service templates, there's just a list of Ansible tasks. Um, so we chose Ansible for this because um, it's a bit more of an imperative tool. Um, and generally during an upgrade, you want to do a sequence of steps. Um, whereas Puppet has proven you know, a nice solution for the configuration management, but it's more of a you know, declarative system. And um, so we went with Ansible in this case because you need to do things like disable the service and then perhaps do some database operations. Um, and you know, sometimes there are other migration steps that you need to do um, for each release. Um, and this makes it, again, quite user-friendly. If you're maintaining a service, you can just modify those tasks. And we apply it in a series of steps. So when we do a deployment with Puppet, um, we apply um, Puppet in a series of steps, uh, which controls the order that the services come up. And we do the same on upgrade. Uh, so on step one, we might disable the services. On step two, you can do a package update. On step three, um, you know, you can do some migrations. Um, and so that all fits together quite nicely. Um, that's probably going to change a bit during the Pike cycle um, as we move to containers, because uh, the containers are going to enable us to do potentially more things like rolling upgrades um, and uh, you know, running mismatched versions of services and things. So there's probably going to be a bit less use of the, of the, um, the Ansible tasks, uh, because um, we'll be able to treat the upgrades more like a minor update um, in many cases. Um, so that's kind of um, the current status there. Um, it fits together quite nicely. Um, and uh, yeah, that was all I had to say about um, composability. So I can hand back to Emilian to go through the roadmap. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So this slide is a summary of things we did, we we mentioned during this this discussion. But yeah, the next the next big things for us the <clears throat> integration with Kubernetes 
it's like uh, everyone talks about it. And if you went to the summit sessions, at least all the slides they have at least one time Kubernetes world. So we had to place it. So um, <laughs> that's the only reason we have it there. Yeah, we have also uh, people working on uh, improving performances at scale. Um, we, like um, Steve said, we are moving to um, upgrades, and we are trying. We are moving to upgrades to con with containers running upgrades, and I hope that we, this will um, help to reduce the downtime that you might have uh, with the current architecture. So that's uh, that's something we are working on with the, the um, containers upgrades. Um, we also have uh, different blueprints and features that hopefully will improve the. Um, usability, the usability for debugging triple O when something's wrong. Uh, we we got the feedback from users, and I, we understand it's very complex to debug. So we 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 have uh, some some features coming in Pike for improving this uh, user experience. Um, the list of blueprints is huge. Uh, we just uh, throw the link if you want to have more details on what's going on. Um, and Again, if you have any question about some specific features or, or things that we talk during this discussion, uh, please, uh, we have uh, the time, I think. Um, just a last slide about how you can get involved, if not already. Um, in Triple O, we have, a, of course, we have an IRC channel. It's on Freenode. We use the OpenStack dev mailing list. We use the Triple O tag. Uh, there is the link for the official documentation. And we have a, like um, Steve has a blog and we, we have some blogs, people are blogging. We have a, like a planet with all the triple O uh, related posts. So that's, a, that's the major ways to get involved. But um, how you can get involved uh, as a user, uh, giving feedback, filing bugs, uh, showing up on IRC and complain, it's already a good contribution. Uh, because, yeah, that's what we need in OpenStack, just feedback. Um, if you're a developer, of course, working on um, helping us to stabilize Triple O. Um, if you're working on features, um, we have a bunch of uh, uh, open bugs for a long time, and th there are many ways to contribute to Triple O. I'm not going to list all of them, but if you have any interest in contributing to Triple O, you can. Uh, come to us directly. I don't mind, like email or IRC, whatever, and uh, uh, we will, of course, welcome new new contributions. Um, I think that's it. We have time um, for questions, um, and there is a microphone here. If you have any any questions about Triple O, about the roadmap, about uh, OpenStack, you can come here. Yeah. I have a request. Um, uh, I'm here to complain. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, the uh, one congrats. First thing first, congrats because the software from Newton on board is becoming very flexible. I must say. And one thing, one feature that would be very handy, I think, would be um, sometimes when you start to the a deployment, it's very easy that if you make a mistake during the creating the template, etc. So you you need what you need to do is delete and restart the installation. Um, unless probably um, uh, you are you are on, a, on on the phase where Puppet is running, so probably you can rerun it and it will complete the installation. Uh, one thing that will be will be handy would be um, when there is a when it, when the fail uh, would be nice that if the software would be able to let you restart from that step, so re redo the step, so you can you can fix fix your template for example, and uh, restart from that from that step. So in, in theory, that should already be possible. Um, so when you run, the, the, there's the command to do the overcloud deployment is OpenStack overcloud deploy. Um, and you should just be able to rerun that um, every time because heat supports uh, doing updates from a failed state. Um, and what should happen is anything that has already completed should be left alone. Anything that's failed um, will be replaced, the, the heat resources. And then you'll continue from that point. Um, so if that's not happening, um, probably it would be a good idea to raise a bug. Um, in terms of the configuration layer, um, one of the complaints has been um, you know, the series of, uh, of heat applied software configuration. Um, 
uh, resources can be a, a bit hard to debug. Um, and so during Pike, some of that is moving more towards um, heat driving an Ansible playbook. And so um, when that fails, it may well be possible. In fact, one of my aims is to make it possible to run that manually um, using um, a dynamic inventory that already exists for triple O validations. And uh, you know, that's probably going to be more of an, an advanced user interface. Um, and you wouldn't need to do that by default, but for debugging the sort of the software configuration layer, I think that's going to make a bit of an easier feedback loop. Um, so that may possibly help. Um, but if there are specific issues where you can't just rerun the deploy command, uh, yeah, let me know because it may well be a bug. Yeah, so, so the main thing is if it fails, you don't have to delete the stack. You can just rerun the command, um, yeah. and then it should pick up and where it left off. Depending on the state of the, the, the nodes that are deploying, uh, it depends on if, if you're going to run again, it, if the state of the node was like, for example, the, the pacemaker cluster was not like bootstrap it correctly. And if you run again and it's failing again, it's maybe something in the nodes like that failed to be deployed. So Yeah, I mean, there are certain failures that you mm. can't recover from. Like if, uh, you know, you're requesting the wrong number of nodes and, you know, you don't, you can't satisfy that based on what is in Ironic or if the Ironic nodes are tagged incorrectly, um, you know, those kinds of things are, are, you know, you have to obviously fix that. But even in that case, you should just be able to rerun the deploy and it shouldn't, um, mm. uh, it shouldn't have to delete any of the nodes that have already been built. What's going to be done in the case of um, failures of certain nodes? Um, we have it often that we have, I don't know, deploying 10 or 20 nodes and, I don't know, three or four have a problem, they will not be deployed, then my stack fails. But intentionally, I don't want to fail it because 15 are there and um, I'm happy with that. And I can just repeat the command and the other five, whatever they have, will come up later on. Yeah. So. Are there any work, uh, is there any work done about that? So there's been some discussion on that and there's an open bug. I think James has, has, has been looking at that as well. Um, I mean, it, it kind of ties into my comment about the, the move towards having a bit of a, we have a single, um, if, if you have a single piece of configuration, you know, and, and we can have a failure, which uh, we, we then can rerun the configuration on those nodes that, that actually got built, uh, you know, the, the move towards more Ansible usage may help with that. Um, but James, did yeah, you have anything to say? Yeah, so that, ha that has been a common pain point for folks, and we're aware of that. So, um, yeah, the main problem is um, that's not really a good fit for the kind of declarative heat model, and so we need a way to kind of um, get beyond that error state uh, using the underlying tool. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, hopefully something which we can um, resolve during Pike as well as a result of the refactoring I've been doing uh, for containers upgrades, and that involves moving more towards Ansible. So I have a question regarding this container approach. Previously, uh, Disk Image Builder was used to generate image uh, OS plus over cloud OpenStack RPMs, and now we have this Cola, uh, Cola image, but still underneath we have bare metals, right? And we need OS. So, in the, uh, so n how it works now? So you still use Disk Image Builder uh, OS plus this Cola images or? The way to build the base images has not changed. Mm -hmm. uh, Cola, Cola build is used only to build the images, the container images are going to run. So. Uh, actually, just to refine that, like currently what we're doing is we're using the same overcloud tooling to, to deploy containers. I actually think <coughs> as we go towards full containerization, we can actually stop installing OpenStack packages going to be, I mean, as an initial step for Pike, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's going to still be RHEL or some cloud service. So I feel like it's important to um, you know, mention that. And, and just to also mention, uh, you know, previously, we actually did have, uh, you know, if you wind back to like three or four releases, we actually have had uh, container support for quite mm -hmm. a while for compute roles. Um, but that, the previous stuff has actually been focused <coughs> on running on e-commerce. So we kind of just took sort of a step back. Let's not break people. Let's not break um, you know uh, existing deployments. 
point, it goes towards containerization as well. And then, um, I, you know, I think longer term, there might be an interest in, in some of the, in some of the, the lighter weight of containerized operating systems. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I would, I think we will convene on a leaner version of the mm -hmm. class goal and force a change. Okay. You mentioned Octavia before, and I was just a bit curious how the status is at the moment. Is it already fully implemented or just partially? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the thing that I, I had discussion is today with Asaf. I don't know if he's here. Okay. Um, we we are still figuring out how to make the Euphoria image the, the post deployment. Right now, it's manual. So when you deploy. Octavia um, on the control plane, you just have the API and um, you have to deal with the Euphoria image afterward and upload to, you know, to Nova and this workflow is not automated yet. And, uh, but as far as I know right now, you can deploy all the Octavia services on the control plane. So you have the API, the engine and all the services. Uh, I don't remember the names, but that's the status, but we didn't figure out yet with the, the post-deployment thing. But okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so I often face a problem with uh, network config. Um, so it often happens that I, I lose connection because I, I had a wrong template. Um, so um, is there any plan to make some validation before actually I apply this network configuration? We actually added a feature. I don't know, it comes, it's been in for a while. It, it, so. If the network config is applied and it can't ping back to the underclass gateway, mm -hmm. then it should roll back to just the vanilla DHCP configuration. That, that doesn't work, though. It doesn't always work? It's, it's basically yeah. always been broken. It's, it's not foolproof, but it won't work in some cases. It, it works in the Uh, I used Mitaka and now Okata. Okay. Okay. So I, I will check it. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you have more questions or more feedback, uh, I stay here a little bit longer. So, thanks.